OK, so welcome to the third tutorial for the LACE expansion and self-avoiding walk course. Uh, today, our, our topic will be the LACE expansion for the self-avoiding walk. And we're going to come at it from a different angle, the, the, a kind of algebraic angle, which is the original approach that was taken by Bridges and Spencer uh, in 1985. Okay, so I'm going to make a couple of definitions, and some of them are slightly counterintuitive. I'm going to look at a set of, uh, I'm going to look at a graph on a, an interval, which is any set of edges st uh, within, within the interval. I'm going to make the universal convention that s is always less than t, just for, for ordering purposes. And also, I want all of these to be, uh, all of these are integers. In fact, for, from now forward, everything is going to be an integer. And I'm going to make this definition of whether a graph is connected. I'm going to say that it's connected. Well, one way to phrase it is that if you look at the union of the open intervals corresponding to each edge, that that should be the entire open interval for the entire, uh, for the entire interval. So let me draw you some pictures about that. And actually, this is, this is essentially going to answer question one. So question one is to show that path connected in the ordinary sense of graphs on, on a set of points is not the same as this notion of connected. So let me first draw you some points and some edges that would be connected normally. I could do these edges, for example, and every point communicates with every other point. This is not the notion that we're interested in here. Let me draw you a graph that's connected in our new sense. This graph is connected. In fact, this one just has one, uh, one edge, which is the entire interval A to B. So it certainly satisfies this requirement. Or here's another possibility. I have these two edges, and maybe I can even add in a third one for, ex for extra. Uh, and if you look at the open intervals that these edges enclose, they add up to the entire space. By contrast, here's one that would not be connected. Uh, well, in fact, sorry. Uh, this original example that's path connected is not connected in our new notion uh, because uh, the, the second point here is not within any of the open intervals of the edges that lie on top of it. It's not protected from the rain that you can think of as coming down. And conversely, this example is not path connected. It's the set of integers, yes. I'm, I'm going to use this real interval notation, but actually everything, everything, everything is going to be an integer now. Uh, it's not connected because this point, a plus 1, is not within, uh, does not lie in the union of the open intervals of the edges. So it lies, it's, it's on the end point of this edge, and of this edge, and of this edge, but there's no interval that goes across it. And if you translate that back into the language of sets and open intervals, it, it also it fails this condition as well. <coughs> OK, now the, the next thing we're going to do is to define a certain sum of uh, a, certain, a certain product, which is going to be related to the, the self-avoiding walk. So I'm going to define. k for an interval a to b to be the product over all the s and t within the interval of the quantity 1 plus u s t. Now, I'm making a sort of convention here. Uh, u s t, remember, is, the, is the, the, the negative of the indicator that s and t Sorry, that omega of s and omega of t are the same point. And uh, it, this, depend, this depends implicitly on omega. I'm going to generally drop this dependence on omega as if it were a, sort of like a random variable. Okay. So I have this product. And so you can. Excuse me, but then how a and b relate to the length of that 
Right. So this would correspond to uh, a self-avoiding walk from the time interval from A to B. And typically, we'd be interested in A being 0 and B being n, say. OK. So specifically, we have that Cn of x, for example, our counting function for self-avoiding walks, we can realize that as being the sum over all omegas in the walks of n steps from 0 to x of k on the interval 0 to n. And I fear I've noted, noted its dependence on omega. Uh, no, this time I just mean uh, all S and T. Okay. Okay. But your question is very opposite because I'm in just now going to uh, tell, well, in fact, for question two, we're going to reformulate K in terms of these graphs which we've just introduced. So question two is to show that K of AB can actually be re rewritten as the sum over all gammas that are graphs, and that's the symbol B of AB, then I'm going to take the product over all edges, ST, which are in gamma, of UST. OK, and this might seem a little bit uh, puzzling at first, but this is actually a quite straightforward uh, concept. So. Uh, it's actually an, uh, an application of a well-known well identity, which I've, which I've actually put up here. So if you take any product of something of the form 1 plus ui over any set of, of indices i, you can reformulate that by summing over sets of indices and then taking the product of just the ui, now without the 1, uh, in here. This is a kind of binomial theorem kind of, kind of expansion. Okay. Uh, so this actually follows quite... Uh, in, in a sort of trivial way from, from, that, uh, from, that from that identity. Here we're noting that B being, in a, being a graph is equivalent to just being a set of edges by our definition. Uh, this starts to explain something that might have seemed a trifle curious at first. Uh, why did we have U being the negative of an, in, of an indicator function? Couldn't we have just said 1 minus U all the time? And it's essentially for, for this kind of reason, uh, if we, uh, it's, we're doing a kind of expansion in, in, uh, mono, uh, in terms of monomials in the U's, and it's convenient if they kind of carry around their, their minus signs with them instead of having, us to, uh, having, having to write them in manually every time. So the proof of this I'll just call, uh, I'll appeal to star, which will be this formula here. Oh, it's, it's similar to a sort of, it's sort of similar to the ideas you use when you look at the binomial, binomial expansion. If you look at x plus y to the power n, you can choose factors of each from one or the other. OK, so, so far nothing much really has happened. But now I'm going to start using these notions of graph and connected in a kind of more non-trivial way. So I'm going to define J of AB, taking our inspiration from this formula, I'm going to write it in terms of a sum over graphs. And this time I want my graph to be connected. Uh, so this is script G represents the, su the set of connected graphs. And I'm going to take the same product, the product over edges, in my graph of UST. Okay. So question three asks you to prove an identity, which is the first sort of non-trivial identity we're going to have. K of... AB can be rewritten as K of A plus 1B 
plus, and then I'm going to have the sum from j equals a plus 1 to b of j from a to j times k on the rest of the interval from j to b. Okay, and I'll remind you, of course, that these all depend implicitly on the path omega. I should mention here that this definition applies for a strictly less than b, and so does this formula. Okay, now this formula takes a certain amount of, of thought because it, it's, we've produced a lot of abstraction without quite knowing quite why yet. Uh, but actually, something quite, sim quite simple is happening here. J represents a connected piece uh, from a, uh, a connected part of the, of the path, of the graph, rather, a connected part of the graph from A to J. So we're going to look at the, we're going to look at our graph. And let me look at case one, which is where A does not belong to any edge. So case one is that A does not belong to any edge, and that means that, in fact, all the edges are from A plus 1 to B. So I can actually think of a graph where A, is not an, where a does not appear in any edge as actually belonging to a graph from A plus 1 to B. Okay, so for this example, gamma, gamma I can really think of as uh, sorry, as lying in as lying in the set of graphs from a plus one to b. Okay, so that's going to account for our first term here. And now we're going to do something that is sort of natural from a graph and connectedness point of view, which is to say that if a is not isolated, so if there is an edge emerging from a, then I'm going to look at the the connected component corresponding to A. So if we have A and B here, and suppose this is my graph. Okay, so A contains at least one edge coming out of it. So you can argue by sort of general terminology uh, that surely there must be a connected component corresponding to A. And in fact, there is. This takes a certain amount of checking of definitions and so on. Uh, but what's going to happen is that I can write gamma as being gamma prime union with gamma, say, double prime, uh, where Gamma prime will be a connected graph. It'll be the component containing A. Oops, sorry. It will lie in the connected graphs from A to some J. And gamma prime, gamma double prime, will be just some graph on the remainder of the space. from J to B. Ah, yes, I was missing an edge here. OK, so if we look at this graph, we want to know what is J and what are gamma and gamma prime. So J is the point where you stop being connected to A, or where the, the part of the graph from A stops reaching, essentially. So this is J here. OK, this may seem a trifle counterintuitive because you've got this edge carrying on right after J. But remember, this is the kind of rain definition. Uh, J is the first spot that isn't completely covered by the umbrellas of, the, of those edges. So this is J. All the edges to the left are gamma prime. And all the remaining edges are gamma double prime. And of course, by definition, essentially, gamma prime must be connected. 
whereas gamma double prime, there's no particular reason why it should be connected or not. Okay, so that's, that's what's happening in this sum here. I'm going to sum over the possible values of j, and then I've got my, uh, I've got my connected graph, and I've got my not necessarily connected graph. Okay, so the next thing I'm going to do is, using this j, I'm actually going to jump sort of right to the punchline. I'm going to tell you a formula for pi m of x. And later I'll explain, next we'll sort of see why this formula is the right formula. So I'm going to define pi m of x to be the sum over omega, uh, which is a walk from in m steps from 0 to x of the quantity j, so j 0 m of omega. This is sort of by analogy with our formula, uh, our formula here for, for cn of x, but now we're restricting to a certain subclass of our, of our graphs. And question four asks you to prove that this pi m does what, you, what it's supposed to do. So what it's supposed to, to satisfy is that cn of x should be, we have a convolution. Uh, and actually, let me write out, uh, so this appears in your problem statement. Let me write out the convolution in long form now. This is a sum over y in zd. We've got C1 of y, C n minus 1 of x minus y as our first term. And then the second sum is a sum from j, which is 1 to n. Again, a sum over y. And then pi m of y and c n minus m of x minus y. OK, and of course, this is sort of hint in the question, which is that you're supposed to use the previous question to, to prove this identity. Uh, m, yes, thank you. And when you start thinking along these lines, actually, it looks sort of a lot like, like this one does in a way. There's one sort of leading term with a difference of 1. And then there's the sum from, well, this would be from 1 to m. Uh, we've got j corresponding to pi and k corresponding to c. So what's actually going on here? Well, the, the thing is that we're essentially breaking our summation over omegas that was here and in the formula for back there for c, we're breaking that summation into two more or less independent sums. So what I'm going to, to say informally is that if we look at the sum over all omegas, which are walks of n steps from 0 to x, I can think of that as corresponding to a sum over y, which I'll come to in a second, and then a sum over the two parts of the walk from 0 to m and a sum over the remainder of the walk. Okay, I've been a little bit loose in my terminology because we didn't really use this w m n of x of y x. Uh, but what I mean by this is that omega 1 should be a walk that starts at time m and ends at time n. And in that time, it travels from y to x. Okay. And this is sort of more or less obvious because, well, 
y just corresponds to the value of the walk at, at time m. And I think I forgot to sum over, no, sorry, this is, this is correct. Uh, y corresponds to the value of the walk at time m. And once you fix that, well, essentially, these, these two walks, omega 0 and omega 1, that are the two parts on each side, are independent. And this independence is reflected in the fact that these sums are uh, not, there's no condition relating omega 1 to omega, two, to omega 0 in these sums. No, no, okay, so that's, that's the thing. Remember that these omegas, uh, these omegas are just a priori walks of any kind. Of course, we're interested in, in computing walks that are in fact self-avoiding, and to that end, uh, I guess it, it's, it's perhaps gone now, but we defined Cn in terms of sums of, of k over of omega. Uh, but omegas themselves have no, uh, no self-avoidance structure at all. Okay, so the, the question is going to follow from this observation uh, pretty much uh, pretty easily. Uh, for example, when we do the sum over omega 1, which is a walk from m to n of going from y to x, and we put that into k from m to n of omega 1, well, that's going to be C n minus m of, of x minus y. And essentially what we're using here is a sort of translation invariance in both space and time to turn this into a subtraction and to turn the, uh, the y minus x into a subtraction as well. And that, that's pretty, um, pretty easy to convince yourself of. Right, and the other thing that's going on is that, well, initially we had, on the right-hand side, we had this product, uh, a j and a k, and essentially what's happening is that they split. So formally, I can write down that j 0 to m of omega and k m to n of omega, when you do this, this correspondence of, of sums, this corresponds to j 0 to m. j 0 to m depends only on omega uh, 0. And k m to n depends only on omega 1. So everything splits nicely, and you can factor this sum into the pi m from j's and the c n minus m from the k's. Okay, there's a similar kind of argument to be made for the first term, and it's, it's very similar, so I'll just make a couple of remarks. But uh, for the first term, what I can remark is that the number of choices for the walk omega zero and this time, omega 0 must be a one-step walk, a walk of one step from 0 to some y. That number is precisely c1 of y. One other thing that might have slightly popped out at you is that my sum here went from m equals 1 to n, and if you are very, very alert, you may remember that the sum normally went from 2 to n. Uh, in fact, you can convince yourself that pi 1 of y is actually 0. OK, now I'm going to introduce one more, uh, one more definition, a lace. And here, finally, we're seeing the, the, magic, the magic word for lace expansion. Uh, a lace L 
is a minimally connected graph. Okay, so formally what I mean by that is that L is connected. L is connected, and if we take any strict subset then gamma will not be connected. All right, so let me just uh, put you up the, remind you of the properties we're going to prove in the next question. Then I'll draw a bunch of pictures of what laces are and what laces aren't. So suppose I've got a lace L, or a potential lace L, and I go to write it in terms of its edges S1, T1, up to Sn, Tn. OK, now just for ordering purposes, I assumed, of course, that all the S's are less than all the T's. That's, that's my uh, universal assumption right here. And uh, for definiteness, I'm going to assume that the S's are ordered, so SL is no more than SL plus 1. Okay. Now what I want to prove is the following description, and I'll write it down and then I'll write all the pictures that it corresponds to. L is a lace, if and only if, three things are supposed to occur. The first endpoint is A, and it's strictly less than the second endpoint. We have a similar condition at the other side, Sn strictly less than T n minus 1, strictly less than Tn, which is B. And in the middle, we have the following pair of inequalities. S L plus 1 should be strictly less than T L, which would be non-strictly less than S L plus 2. This is for L between 1 and n minus 2. OK, phew. This was a, uh, a fair amount of stuff. So let, let's draw some pictures that corresponds to that. And actually, at the same time, I'm going to show that these conditions are the right ones, at least at the level of pictures. OK, so what's, what, here's something. Here is a graph. With just one edge that goes all the way from A to B. Okay, so it, this is a lace. It's connected because it met our definition of a connected graph. And certainly it's minimally connected because there's only a one edge. You couldn't possibly take it out. Here's another lace. This time I'll put a number of edges in. OK, this one is also a lace. And if you actually are used to actual things that are really called laces, you know, what, what real people in the real world call, by, call laces, this is kind of what a lace looks like. It's got this kind of, uh, it's got this kind of overlapping arch pattern when you actually make real lace. So this kind of picture is, is I think, roughly why, why the word lace was chosen in this context. OK, so those were laces. And I'll leave it to you, to, for example, to convince yourself that you can't take any of these edges out. Here are some that are not laces.
OK, so this one's not a lace. And we can actually see specifically why this one's not a lace. Uh, if we look at this edge here, this one violates the condition, uh, violates the first of those conditions. This one has S1 equal S2. Okay, so two edges with the same left endpoint. This is never allowed for a lace. Okay, now in terms of the actual definition, what's going wrong here? Well, this edge is not required. If I took it out, I would still have a connected graph because I'd still have the remaining two edges that would, that would be a form a connected graph in my definition. Uh, so, so this edge is redundant. OK, so this one was not minimal. Let me just label these with numbers so that I can refer to them. This one was minimal, and it failed part of condition one. OK, here's another, here's another thing that will not be a lace. This one's not a lace because, well, actually, it's not even connected. Remember that, uh, note that to, if you want to be connected, your left endpoint has to be in some edge. And this one's not in any edge. So this one has A strictly less than S1. It's not connected. Uh, so this one also violates condition, oops, condition 1. And let's do a few more. Let's try and get a fairly sparse one this time. OK, this one is also not a lace. And this one, in fact, is not connected either. Uh, specifically, in terms of the setup here, it failed uh, this condition right here because Sn was too big. It was bigger than Tn minus 1. OK, let's, sorry, just to review what these are. So here is A is S1. This point is T1. It's also equal to S2, the left endpoint of the second edge. And B is T2. Uh, but in this case, T1 and S2 are the same, which violates, which violates our condition, part of condition 2. And you can see that this one's not going to be connected. OK, so so far we've more or less convinced ourselves that we need to have 1 and sum of 2. Uh, actually, there are, there are three more, uh, two more relations in, in the part of two, but these are essentially symmetric with, with the ones we saw in one, so I'm not going to draw pictures for those. OK, uh, and so let's see what that, three, that third condition is meaning. So for that, I'm going to draw a slightly longer graph now. Are these graphs sufficiently visible in the back? OK, good, thanks. OK, so this one is also not connected. And you can kind of stare at it for a while, and you can realize that rain is going to fall in there. Uh, so this one is not connected. And specifically, this one's violating the condition SL plus 1 is too big, it's bigger than or equal to TL. 
And this was part of condition three. OK, so this one is, if we look here, we've got T2. So that's the right endpoint of the second edge, is the same as the left endpoint of the third edge. Which means that there's a gap which, 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 did, which we did not cover. OK, and the last one is that other funny condition. So here I'll need another long graph. One. So this one is connected, uh, but it will not be minimal. And you can see that because if you look at, let's see, where are we? So we have the T1 is here, the ed right endpoint of the first edge. Our second edge is, is pretty much OK. But then our third edge starts here to the left of T1. And this is a problem. This violates condition 3. So the upshot is that this one is not minimal. And you can see that it's not minimal because I can remove one of these edges. Uh, specifically, I can remove uh, I can remove that edge there, and the graph will still be connected. OK, so this one was not a lace. OK. so. Uh, I hope this, these pictures give you some idea now of, of what exactly a lace is. It has to have this coverage in this sort of, as for example, in this canonical lace pattern. And then it can't have too many extra edges because those would prevent it from being minimal. Okay. Now what I've actually done in terms, of, in terms of the question statement is I've proved, or at least argued, that these conditions are uh, necessary, I guess. Uh, I haven't proved that they're sufficient. I'm not going to do that. Uh, it's not too hard to show. Uh, and it amounts to showing that, uh, uh, essentially, inductively, you can, you can show, for example, that each edge cannot be removed and that the graph is, is connected. Okay. So next, I'm going to describe a procedure that will relate general connected graphs with these special connected graphs, these laces. So this is the, uh, what's described in the notes as that quantity L sub gamma. OK, so given a lace gamma, I'm going to produce, sorry, given a connected graph gamma, a gamma that's a connected graph, I'm going to produce an L sub gamma that corresponds to it. It will be a subset, and it will be a lace. Okay. And this I'm going to do primarily by picture, and then the, the algorithmic description is given in, your, uh, in the handout. So suppose I've got the following graph with seven dots. And let's put on the following edges. This one, this one, OK, these edges. OK. And I want to see what the algorithm is going to give me as I do, as I apply it to this graph. OK, so the first step of the algorithm, 
and essentially it's similar to all the subsequent steps, I'm going to look as far as I can to the right from where I am currently. Well, currently I'm at, I'm at A right here. So I'm going to require my edges to be based at A. And I'm going to go as far as I can to the right. So I can reach, and from A I can reach this vertex here, but I can reach an even vertex, further vertex, which is here. So this is going to be T1. And by definition, S1 is always A. Okay. Next, I'm going to look at all the edges whose left endpoint is to the left of my, of my current T1. And of those, I want to find the one that goes as far as I can to the right. I'm going to do this in a kind of greedy way. So I can't get all the way to the endpoint, B, but I can get almost there. I can get as far as here from, uh, from edges to the left of, of T1. And actually, I have two choices. Uh, the edge to here and the edge to here, and I'm going to decide to take the one that is f the longest of those choices, so this one. So that means that my S2 is going to be here, and my T2, the right endpoint, is going to be there. So I've taken this edge. Okay, and now I want to do the same thing again. I want to look at all the edges that start to the left of T2 and choose the one that goes the farthest. Actually, this time I'm going, to, I'm going to be at the end because I'll be able to get all the way to B. So I want to choose of all the edges that reach as far as B, I want to choose the longest. Now this time I've actually got, I've again got two choices. Uh, I'm going to choose this one, which is the longest. Uh, so I'm going to choose S3 is actually the same as T1 in this case, and B is T3. Okay, so uh, what you'd, you'd want to convince yourself of is that this defines a, defines a lace. Certainly it, it does in, in this example. This algorithm defines a lace, and we'd like to know... Uh, about properties of this, of this mapping. Okay, I'll, I'll leave it unproven that this, this algorithm is well-defined and always defines a lace. That's not too bad to check if your original graph is connected. So let's move on to question six, which is to prove the following. Suppose I take a, a graph gamma, and I want to know if my result is, of this algorithm is a specified lace L. I want to get a condition for that. So first of all, L had better belong to gamma in the first place, because, well, obviously, we only choose edges that were originally present. And yes, sorry, I need to introduce one definition. So gamma minus L should be a subset of the compatible edges for the lace. And let me write down that definition next. So the compatible edges are the edges that we could have added to L without destroying uh, and still have gotten back the same, the same L. So specifically, ST is the set of edges ST. And let's say they're not in L to begin with such that if you add them to L, if you add that edge to L, and apply my lace-producing algorithm, that I should get back L. Okay, so what I'm wanting to prove is that for an arbitrary uh, graph gamma, the condition for whether I would have recovered L is that, well, first of all, gamma should contain L, and that the difference of the two sets should consist only of edges which individually 
were compatible with the lace. And Roland, I can probably, I can probably uh, erase that one too. Thanks. Um, okay. Let me do a, a quick example of some compatible and non-compatible edges. So here's a lace. If I draw, uh, if I draw this edge, that one is compatible. Because you can check that had I applied the algorithm with this green edge added on, I would have still gotten the, the white graph that I started with. On the other hand, this orange edge is not compatible because if that had been, my, if that had been added to my white graph, I would have gotten a different result from my lace algorithm. OK, so this takes a certain amount of thought at first, because it's not entirely clear how you can add arbitrary subsets of, of edges and whether that will modify the result of your algorithm. But actually, there's something, in a way, sort of very simple going on in this, in this question here. Uh, and that's to do with an idea of maximality. So let me rephrase the algorithm slightly from the way it's stated in your handout. Let me say that. At each stage, uh, so I'm choosing, I've already chosen, let's say, oops, I've chosen the ith edge in my, in my L sub gamma, and I want to choose the next, uh, the i plus first edge to go in my gamma. Uh, okay, and once again, I've, I've leapt into the conclusion before I gave you quite all the definitions I wanted to, gave, to give. So let me introduce one other thing first, which is an order relation on edges. So I'm going to say that two edges are ordered in the, in the following sense. S and T will be bigger than some other edge, S prime, T prime, if and only if one of two things happens. Either T is bigger than t prime, so either we go further to the right, or they're equal and the uh, st is larger, so or longer. So t minus s should be bigger than t prime minus s prime. Okay, so either further to right or failing that longer. Okay, so with that, with that observation, or with that definition, I can make the following uh, statement. At each step, given the previous uh, choice of edge, my algorithm is as follows. Choose among all among all edges of, uh, let's say, st of gamma with whose left endpoint is to the right of my current t, of my current right endpoint, uh, among all those edges, choose the maximal one. Okay, and you can quickly check that this, this was, in fact, the algorithm we were following, although we stated it in a, in a slightly different way. Okay, and you can, you can check, for example, that this, this, uh, this relation defines a total ordering on all the edges. Uh, the, the, the edges are well ordered by this, by this relation, and that's partly why this algorithm is well defined in the first place. And then, uh, well, okay, so where, where do we stand now? We want to prove this statement, and I'm going to say that I'm actually done. That this, is actually, this is actually all you need to prove the statement. OK, and actually, well, this, I guess it takes a little more thought, so maybe I'm not quite done. Okay. The argument is as follows. If, well, okay, maybe not QED, but if 
Uh, so I'm going to do the following series of reformulations. So suppose I've got gamma, which is L together with some other, some other edges A. Okay. Uh, I can assume that it's of this form because this, um, this inclusion is sort of automatic, automatically needed. Okay, so suppose I add some extra edges to A. I want to claim that they're all in A. Oh, sorry, they're all compatible. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that for every edge that I added, and for every step in my algorithm, so for every i, let me say, uh, it means that the one I actually chose, the SIT, SI plus 1, TI plus 1 that actually is in L, was the one that was maximal. Is maximal among the admissible edges, the admissible choices from, let's see, it was L together with ST. Okay, so this is the reformulation of, of this statement. It's saying that for every ST and A, it was actually compatible, which means that when I, when I ran it, when I added it to L and ran the algorithm, that I should have gotten back L. Okay, so that's this statement. And, well, now I'm going to do something that looks, well, it looks like almost nothing. I'm just going to say that's the same as saying that for every i, uh, s, the one I actually chose, was maximal among choices from Uh, from L union A. And that's exactly what I claimed. So this is, that's exactly what it means that L gamma should equal L. Uh, where gamma equals was L union A. Okay, so it follows essentially only from this, this fact that we were choosing them in a maximal kind of way and then some, some thinking. Okay, now question seven, now that we've done all this work, question seven turns out to be actually quite trivial. Uh, it's actually, again, an application of my identity over here about uh, products with, of one plus something. And so I'll leave you to work uh, that out yourself. And what I'd like to do in the last uh, couple of minutes is to tell you how, with this characterization, we can recover the pictures that we were seeing in, uh, in the LACE expansion uh, lecture this morning. Okay, so I'm going to try and draw you a few, uh, a few p uh, pictures. And let me, first of all, give you the, the definition that we're looking at. So when we wrote down our original equation, it was all um, the main variable you saw was m, small m. But actually, this variable capital N, which is the number of the number of edges in the lace, oops, turns out to be much more interesting. Essentially, N controls the, the topology of the, of the configurations. And I'll try and describe that. So we defined JN to be the sum uh, where we take the product over edges in the lace. For each edge in the lace, we take a u. And for each compatible edge, we take our ordinary uh, avoidance factor 1 plus ust. So essentially, what we want to do is, is to describe what sort of omegas will give non-zero contributions in, 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 such a, in such a quantity. Okay, let me try and do that briefly with, with a few pictures. So let's start with n equals 1. Well, uh, what's, a, what's a lace with one edge? Well, there's only one. If we go on to go from 0 to m. We have to do that. 
Okay, so that means we need to know uh, what are the compatible edges. Now the compatible edges are all other edges. All edges ST that are not 0M. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, we have to have uh, a UST, we have a UST corresponding to 0 and M, and for any other pair we have a 1 plus UST. Okay, so that means uh, we have two conditions. We have the intersection uh, corresponding to UST being non-zero here, and we have the non-intersections corresponding to 1 plus UST here. OK, so this worked out. This, this algebraic procedure has suddenly led us to a, a pictorial form for omega that, that is very simple, uh, namely that we have to start somewhere. Uh, in fact, we're going to require we start at 0. Uh, we have to go for m steps and return to where we were. Uh, and we have to have been self-avoiding all the while. Uh, and actually, typically, this endpoint we would call x. But in this case, it actually x has to be the same as 0, because I just said we had to come back to where we started. Okay, so this is why we had this diagram together with a delta 0x. Let me quickly do n equals 2. What does a lace with two edges look like? Well, a typical sort of lace is something like this. OK, uh, so this means that I've got T1 and S2 here, it means I have to go from 0 to S2. I go somewhere. Then uh, from S2 to T1, I go back to where I was before. And uh, because I have to have an intersection from 0 to T1. And then from T1 to the endpoint M, I have to go back to where I was at S2. So I actually have to go back like this. Okay, so we're exactly getting these theta diagrams. And then when you look, want to look at the avoidance constraint for this, well, you need to think about what edges exactly are compatible. And the upshot is that most of these edges are compatible. Not all of them, but enough. And you can work this out with a bit of, with a bit of time. Okay, so the avoidance pattern for this one specifically is that if I call these edges 1, 2, and 3, say, for these three, this was interval 1, interval 2, and interval 3, the avoidance pattern is that 1, 2, 3 are all self-avoiding because there are enough compatible edges in here to require that all of them be self-avoiding. Okay. And in the last seconds or so, let me draw you, uh, let me draw you a longer example. Okay, so this is a picture where you have four edges, so there will be several intersections required and several avoidances required. Okay, let me draw out the picture that it corresponds to. So we've got interval one, two, three, four. Okay, now five is actually very small, it's, a, it's an empty interval. Uh, but six is here, and seven is here. OK, and this corresponds to the following picture. I go somewhere, I go back, that's 1 and 2. Then I go somewhere else, possibly. Then I go back to where I was a second ago. That's 4 and that's 3. Then I go somewhere else, possibly. This was interval 5, but actually interval 5 was empty in this particular example, and that corresponded to the fact that this interval could have been could have been of length, this, this walk could have been of length zero. Then I have to go back to where I was earlier and back to where I was here. OK, and you can check that it's possible, uh, it didn't happen here, but it's possible for interval three also to have length zero. OK, and when you work it out, you get the following avoidance pattern, one, two, three, four. 
3, 4, 5, 6, and 5, 6, 7. OK, and how would, you, how would you go about proving that? Well, this amounts to analyzing exactly which edges are going to be compatible. So for example, this edge will be compatible. And that means that that implies that the part of the, the uh, interval 1 has to avoid the interval 4. On the other hand, here are some edges that are not compatible. 3, one joining interval 3 to interval 7. That one's not compatible. And similarly, neither is this one. So that's why, for example, uh, this 3, 4, 5, 6 doesn't have, a, doesn't have the 7 in it. And similarly, this 5, 6, 7 doesn't have the 4 in it. And you can do a similar analysis to get all of the, all of the patterns that you want. OK, that brings us to the end of the seat. So thanks very much. Are there any questions? Yeah. Yes. So I'm, w w which one was it that you were not sure? J, A, B. Right, OK. So J, uh, J, A, B is a little bit harder. J, N, A, B we can deal with pretty easily, because uh, we can count the number of positive and negative factors. Namely, you're going to get one negative sign for each U, S, T, and L. So this is going to have exactly a, a minus 1 to the n. For J, A, B. Uh, let's see. I, I don't think Gordon no, is saying no as well. There's no particular way to interpret it. Okay, thanks.